The scripture for this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb, and she saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and she said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and he went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus's head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside of the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. <laughs> so this week I was, I was thinking about my pastoral internship that I did during seminary at a, a Mennonite church in Indiana. And I was thinking about um, the Easter Sunday of that year. And that church had two pastors on staff. And in one of our uh, pastoral staff meetings uh, leading up to that week, the pastors were talking about whose turn it was to preach on Easter of that year. And I was sort of surprised to hear them both admit that neither of them liked to preach on Easter Sunday. Uh, and anybody have a guess why? Terry is nodding. <laughs> Why is that? It's a high pressure week. It's lots of visitors. You've got to come up with a, a know, banger. Yeah, a home run. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of pressure. Um, you know, it's it's the most important week of the church year, uh, and from a Christian perspective, um, it's the most important event in human history. Uh, so it can feel like a lot of pressure. Um, there's a there's a pressure, obviously, to offer something something meaningful, something that seems profound. Um, but I think there's also a pressure to offer something that feels joyful, something that feels triumphant. Uh, we dress in bright colors. You know, um, a lot of us growing up probably wore our best clothes that we owned on Easter Sunday. Uh, we sing bold hymns. 
And I think that this expectation of pure, unadulterated joy, uh, this isn't a pressure that, that just pastors feel when they're trying to preach to a congregation. Um, I think we've all felt that pressure um, or that expectation. I remember as, as a teenager, um, first realizing um, that, I, that I was trying to get into the right headspace for Easter Sunday. Um, I was supposed to be happy. Um, and this Sunday and, and all that it represents um, was in some mysterious way supposed to have solved all of the world's problems. And if I didn't see that, if I didn't internalize it, uh, something might be wrong. And I don't think I'm alone when I admit that when I look at the world, when I walk down the street every day, it's difficult to always be looking at the world through this lens or through the belief in Jesus's resurrection from the dead. Uh, because the gulf between uh, the world as it is and the world that we wish it was is very profound. And, and that's why this morning I want to say that if you are having trouble feeling the way that you think you're supposed to feel on Resurrection Sunday, that is okay. Um, you don't need to work yourself into a mood. Um, and you don't even need to understand this really strange, mysterious event. When we look at the resurrection story in John's gospel, which we just heard, uh, we see Mary going to the tomb where Jesus was laid very, very early in the morning um, while it's still dark. And when she gets there, uh, the stone is rolled away. And so she runs back and she tells Peter and the unnamed disciple who Jesus loved what she's found. Uh, the stone is rolled away. Um, and so these two race to the tomb. And when this unnamed disciple sees uh, the burial garments lying in the tomb, but there's no body there, the narrator says that this disciple immediately understood that Jesus had been raised. And after he understands this um, or recognize it, he runs back home. And it's interesting that this disciple, right? The one, the disciple that according to John was closest to Jesus, the one who Jesus loved. Um, and the one who is very first to understand what's happened He's not, he's not the focus of this story. He sort of, he sort of seems tangential. Uh, but instead, the story lingers with Mary Magdalene um, at the tomb. Uh, the story lingers at, um, at the place of confusion and sorrow. Mary doesn't run back home. Um, she stays at the tomb and she cries. Even when she sees two angels sitting where the body of Jesus had been, uh, she still doesn't understand what's happening. They ask her why she's crying, which I've always thought was kind of a snarky question. Um, and she answers, well, they've taken away my Lord and I have no idea where they laid him. And she turns around and Jesus is right there, right in front of her face. Uh, and he asks her the same question. Why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? And I think Mary's response is revealing. She says, if you've taken him away, tell me where you put the body and then I will take it and I'll take care of it. Mary is clearly very confused. Um, she doesn't understand what's happening at all. And you can sort of sense her desperation, uh, trying to make sense of the situation um, and then do what she can to make this problem right. Uh, she's scrambling to repair this little bit of damage she thinks has happened. And it's not until Jesus says her name that she realizes who she's actually talking to. Meaning that 
faced with the literal resurrection of Jesus, Mary still has trouble seeing it, um, recognizing it. And this is after Jesus has already predicted his resurrection. Um, it's after Jesus has already raised Lazarus from the dead. Mary saw that. Um, and he is right there now. And she actually asks the resurrected Jesus to take her to his dead body. All that to say, I don't think we should be too hard on ourselves for not seeing the signs of resurrection in the world around us. Um, and for not celebrating with pure, unadulterated joy, because uh, this is a complicated joy. It's joy mixed with sorrow. And the story itself isn't as triumphant as we might expect it to be. Um, if this is the moment when sin and death are swallowed up, uh, compared to even Palm Sunday, where people are lining the streets, shouting Jesus' name, calling him the Messiah, throwing their clothes down so the, so the donkey doesn't have to touch the ground. Um, Compared to that, the story of the resurrection is weirdly subdued. Um, it's quiet. It's disturbing. Maybe even a little bit scary. Um, and I think this tells us that the power of the resurrection doesn't announce itself in parades um, or spectacles. Uh, it happens in quiet, dark places. And what I take from that is that it means that there really is no place in the church for denialism, meaning for denying the reality and even the centrality of pain and disappointment in life, um, or for pretending that as followers of Jesus, um, we will somehow be spared from pain and disappointment and real failure. Jesus appearance to the to the disciples um, on the evening of Easter, uh, it shows us this. Um, how does Jesus prove to his disciples that it's actually him that they're seeing? Uh, that he has actually been resurrected from the dead? Well, he proves himself to them by showing them his wounds on his hands. Um, it's the wounds that convince them that he's Jesus. Um, and so these are the marks that define him now, um, the marks that define his work on earth. Um, wounds, the savior of the world is wounded. It's ironic, not surprising though, that this understanding runs against the grain of much of what we hear from uh, parts of the contemporary American church, um, which talks a lot about being blessed, hashtag, uh, with good things. Um, but it's actually in the wounds where we find Jesus or actually where Jesus finds us. Um, it's by his wounds that Jesus proves himself to us. Um, it's when we're crying outside the tomb, confused, disoriented, and that is good news if we are honest about the realities of what life is like. Um, I think the flip side of this is that if we are having trouble finding Jesus or seeing Jesus in the world around us, um, one possible reason might be that we, we could be avoiding the tomb. Um, the sad places that seem beyond redemption. Um, I think it's safe to ask, where are we looking for Jesus? Now, I'm sure I'm not alone in this, but I could not help but read the passion story this week and not be watching and thinking about something else that's happening in Minneapolis right now, which is the trial um, of the officer who killed George Floyd. 
And as I watched the witnesses give their testimonies, um, so many of them were crying. Um, adults, children, uh, a mixed martial arts fighter. Um, one of the older men that was there said that as he watched uh, George Floyd die, um, what he felt was powerless. Um, and a different, a teenage girl says that she keeps apologizing to George Floyd for not doing more to help him, right? These testimonies were truly heartbreaking. Um, and also the fact that, that George Floyd cried out to his mother um, is eerily reminiscent of, of Jesus's cry to God on the cross. Now, I, I have no idea what all of that means. Um, but what I think that the resurrection story shows us is that Jesus is there. Um, in the midst of that anguish and pain, and in the midst of that brutality, um, he proves himself to us with his wounds. Um, and if we as followers of Jesus and as a community of disciples of Jesus, if we want to bear witness to Christ's resurrection from the dead, if we actually want to encounter him and to be pulled into this story of redemption, part of that means following Mary's example um, of lingering at the tomb of the dark places. <clears throat> And whether we recognize him or not, Jesus is there. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Anybody have thoughts or questions? I was just, I, I liked your point about that question. I just, I enjoyed your point about actual resurrection it was a quiet and dark place there was no fanfare i never really thought about it in those terms and then you brought out the you know uh, the contrast of palm sunday where there was all this fanfare going on and i i'd never really considered that the resurrection happens in quiet dark you know dead spaces you know yeah so that, that was a really good point thanks Anyone else? Sorry, I'm, it's like I've forgotten to how to do this. <laughs> well, I just um, appreciate the, you don't have to work yourself into a mood. Um, like that permission is just really helpful. And also the permission to not fully understand. Like it's just so hard to understand on some level still so I, it's just helpful to be reminded like that's not the point um to perfectly understand like this idea of a resurrection and lastly whenever i'm in like a dark place i always it's my temptation is to think that i've done something wrong or it's a signal that i'm off the off the path or and so it's a real turnaround or paradox to think of it as like that is the only way you can experience uh, redemption is by being in those places going into those places and keeping your eyes open so just a lot of helpful like permission to um, have those dark places in our lives so thank you <laughs>